Welcome everyone to Asian Pacific Voices Radio, where you'll find stimulating conversations that explore diverse topics and stories impacting our Asian Pacific American communities. I'm your host, Joanne Whitlock, and today we have the pleasure of exploring the world of a contemporary multimedia artist whose vibrant creations breathe life into historical narratives and foster compassionate connections within communities. Born in Manila in 1972, he migrated to the United States at 17 and brought with him a rich tapestry of Filipino heritage that now intricately weaves through his remarkable body of work. Known for designing iconic landmarks like the Eastern Gateway to historic Filipino town in Los Angeles and the Gintong Kasaysayan mural, my guest is not only a muralist, but also a visionary who amplifies historically marginalized voices. I'd like to welcome Eliseo Art Silva to Asian Pacific Voices Radio. Hi, Eliseo. Thanks for coming on our show. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me here. Yeah, I'm super, super excited to have you. I've been to Filipino Town. I've seen your incredible mural. So super excited to have you. Thanks so much. Yeah. As yeah. a Filipino American who, you know, who spent... My home childhood in the Philippines, stories like yours are really near and dear to my heart. So super excited to have you. Um, I do want, before we start talking about your work, of course, that's going to be a lot of what we'll be talking about, but I do want to get to know you a little bit personally. So first of all, can you tell us what was life like growing up in Manila before you immigrating to the U.S.? Growing up in Manila uh, was like for like a very happy time. Um, uh, we live in a subdivision and uh, I would say that uh, I was a very shy boy. I actually wanted to be a priest when I was young because uh, I went to Catholic school but um, the art uh, was everywhere uh, in our uh, neighborhood and we go to a place uh, called Tropical Palace which is like a pre-colonial Filipino king's uh, palace and so the golden ages of the Philippines was surrounding me from an early age and so I, I felt blessed that i was able to experience that you know looking back because they don't build filipino palaces anymore right i mean right. Uh, but I, I was able to uh, experience that at a young age so i was very um you know fortunate that in that no, sense no i love that yeah my some of my best years is obviously growing up in my childhood in the philippines and going up in manila so thank you for sharing that so you were talking about you know, the golden age and you know, growing up. Can you share some early influences or experiences in Manila that, that kind of started and sparked your interest in art? My, uh, my, uh, my father gave a painting uh, to my mother when they were like dating or it was like a courtship. <laughs> and uh, there was, there's a painting that I kind of like, was very fascinated with and I, I wanted to know how anybody could do something like that you know it was hanging in our house and and that i think struck my fascination to 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 be an artist you know and uh uh i was able to uh start early uh with the art uh teacher and uh learn how to well actually with before having my own art teacher uh i experimented on uh on my own and used uh, oil paint but didn't know what kind of oil to use so i used cooking oil so the paint actually <laughs> cracked <laughs> uh, because i did not uh, with nobody in our family knows how to uh use the materials art materials so my first painting was the mona lisa um and then the, the last supper was my second painting so and i was like nine years old so yeah this these paintings like are one of my uh my uh earliest you know artwork when and you know the people who bought it thought it was like really really old because it was like cracked you know <laughs> but anyway uh because of the uh not knowing what kind of materials to use for that that's pretty incredible. I know at nine years old, I was definitely just coloring with crayons. I had no, I had no foresight in anything artistic. So it's really incredible to see people, especially young, um, young people get so much passion and, you know, with their projects and with their work. So that is really incredible to hear. I, I, I could say that I probably was ambitious at the, at the, you know, started as an ambitious <laughs> artists starting to you know my first attempt was a, a masterpiece by um da vinci and the other one was uh 
you know, um, a mural in a way of the Last Supper. At 10 years old, I also painted in our children's room. Uh, I combined Batibot and Sesame Street. So I would say that would be the precursor <laughs> to my the Filipino mural where I, I combined, you know, America and the Philippines in one mural. But this this is me at 10 years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to get at next is, you know, how was there a specific time where you felt your art just kind of connected the Filipino communities and fostered compassionate interaction within the community? Well, that happened um, definitely in my first mural and uh, it changed my trajectory because uh, I did not plan to be uh, in the United States and I was going back. Uh, after my uh, bachelor's in Otis, my BFA program, because even before then, when our parents uh, wanted to relocate here, I was almost 18 years old and uh, there was nine of us and uh, I was the oldest and uh, she, they wanted the entire family. My parents wanted the entire family to go, but I wanted to stay. Uh, and I said that, uh, okay, I will co come, uh, but if I did, if I don't get into art school in the U.S., I'll come back because I already had scholarships in the Philippines. Yeah, and and so, you know, when I had a chance to go back uh, after my Otis uh, program, my undergrad, um, that mural uh, made me realize that it had an impact. You know, people were, busloads of people have been, like, visiting from San Diego, Bakersfield, just to see the mural after I finished it. It was like, like probably in one month, I would like be asked to go there and do a tour for like, like eight to 10 to 20 groups of people. Um, and, and, and I realized, you know, this kind of work is very, very um, relevant and, and I guess impactful, you know, um, to our community. So it, it made me realize that that's probably what uh, I need to stay a little bit longer, you know, after that mural that I felt God um, had other plans for me. <laughs> so I stayed. So this is kind of like a wasn't part of my plan. You know, it just kind of just uh, revealed itself that this is something our community needs. I guess because a lot of us, um, feel like, uh, I mean, most people, you know, know that we are invisible as a community. And uh, I think, it, you know, we have a lot of opportunities to tell our story through visual art, but it has to be done right. And I think, it, and, and the way to do it is not to hold back. That's really powerful. So that's, that's what I learned from that first mural. Oh, and I love how you said that, you know, um, you weren't expecting to, you weren't planning on staying long, you weren't planning on, this wasn't the path that you necessarily intended, but that's a perfect example of sometimes the best things happen because they were unplanned and things always happen for a reason. So I think your story is a perfect example of that. And that's really inspiring. So that's really inspiring for future artists to kind of see that not everything is laid out already perfectly. So I love that. You know, Thank you. You're talking about <laughs> how that one mural really really inspired you so what of all the murals and projects that you've worked on then is there a one particularly outside of that one that has a special place in your heart or is that is that the what would you call your what is your big masterpiece well you know uh, remember i did that like uh, when i was 22 years old and i'm like twice as old uh, from from back then it's kind of like your face my first baby right um but <laughs> When I did that, uh, again, uh, the other thing that drove it was that I wanted to be my last performance. You know, that's why I gave everything to that mural. And and uh, to give you a perspective, that mural was not supposed to be the entire wall. It's just supposed to be uh, like a fourth of the wall because they were just going to give us $5,000 for like, you know, like such a big project and they did not require us to paint the entire wall but i uh, even the budget wasn't enough for it right so and i felt like no we deserve we might might as well like paint the entire wall because we have this opportunity to tell our story right and so i i i did that um 
because I felt we deserve it, right? And so the other project that's similar, that has the same kind of, uh, uh, I guess, value to me is the gateway. When, when, when we had this gateway uh, dream, <laughs> it really was a dream, right? Of how can we afford a million dollars in our community? Um, all the comp- there were like so many competitions, uh, but I did not, uh, I did not, uh, uh, I did not compete. I was in the East Coast. I didn't know about the the, the competitions. Uh, the Hi Fi NC uh, Neighborhood Council had a competition, but they weren't able to find a design they liked. So they had a they had another competition, and they asked me to submit a design. And you know the budget was only for a hundred seventy five thousand dollars. And so we cannot afford an entire arch, right? But I said, right. what the heck? You know, we deserve an entire arch. It's like the mural, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, I'll just, like, leap of faith. I just did that. I just designed, I I, I submitted five uh, proposals, and one of them is a full arch. And coincidentally, uh, before uh, the pandemic, we had the Filipina uh, Commissioner of Public Works that had a two-year window to come up. Uh, I mean, he saw opportunity. She saw an opportunity for us to have a gateway, and uh, at, uh, only up to the last minute did she realize we could have a full arch. <laughs> she found <laughs> enough money, and and because yeah. nobody submitted a, a design, it's like a leap of faith. It's like the first mural, right? Uh, my, I did not have to do an entire wall, but I did that, you know, for that small budget, and then for the same. Uh, I, I I don't think about these things. It's just kind of like something that I I felt we we deserve, right? And so right. with the gateway, I was the only one that had a full arch design, and she she thought that this is enough because there would we would not have had that arch had she, there been no design because there's not enough time for a competition. So now that we kind of um, now that we kind of talked about your background and your history that got you to this point, I'm a little curious on how you actually create your art. You know how usually artists have a process; they have the step by step kind of way that they do things. So can you kind of walk us through your typical design process when you create a mural? You know, especially the ones that highlight historical narratives. Like, what is your thought process? How how do you go about it? Well, for me, uh, my my uh, my main um, driving um, what do you call it operating narrative is the golden ages of the Philippines. So when I do a Filipino mural, I I I I find a way I I find a way to bring that out, you know, in terms of the narrative because I think that's something that we don't tell enough, you know, uh, uh, to people. Um, and and so that's that's my my uh the main kind of thing i want to to bring out uh but for other murals it's always the message like what the visually does does the mural want to say and uh it has to come out of the community so it's sen- it's community centric right i mean if i'm doing a mural for students in a school it has to be student centered you know it cannot be something where it's like imposed on them. It has to come out of them to the point that they become the main event of the of the mural. Like they become the models of the mural, and they come up with the stories and they tell the stories, so that it becomes uh, relevant and meaningful to them. In the same way, I do that with our community, and I think that uh, because uh, of our education, where we don't own the knowledge, because most of it is kind of uh, the stories of foreigners in our country meaning it's colonial history, uh, we're not telling our story. We're telling the story of foreigners in our country. So it's not Filipino-centric, right? So it has to be centered first, I guess, as an artist, we have to center ourselves and like who we are. And then we uh, center the mural in terms of the subject, the community or, or the student or, you know. Yeah, I love that there's so much depth to your process that, you know, me, I just start drawing something, you know, whether it's good or not. And there's not a whole lot of thought process behind it. And I love how you can, how you're articulating all the depth and actual background, contextual background to it. So it's pretty incredible. And you talk about the golden age of the Philippines and the community. 
and all that. But is there a who? Is there like a particular person, or is there anything like someone that inspires your artistic vision and philosophies at all? Well, you know, there was a time when um, we were very homesick when we first came here to the United States, and you know, we we came to Riverside in 1989. It was not fully developed. Riverside, I mean, I remember the orange skies, you know. It's like, oh, my gosh, why is that orange? You know, it's like smog and all this, you know. But anyway, it's like uh, there was not a lot of Asians too in, in Riverside. So the first thing I look for is, like, what are, what are, the, what are the Filipino, uh, what do they know about Filipinos? So I went to the library, the main library, and I found, like, only five books on the Philippines. And three of them is about Jose Rizal. <laughs> you know national hero and then and then those books i've i've never seen them i've never read them in the philippines and 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 they gave me a different perspective of Jose Rizal than not the Rizal we knew in the philippines but the Rizal that they were using here in the us to to uh campaign for the us recognition of philippine independence because Rizal day used to be our independence day so Rizal became my hero because he became relevant by I mean, Philippine Americans made him relevant here in the United States, and and uh, he 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 became our connection to the narrative in America, and 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 a lot of Philippine Americans uh, used him as the guide, their guide in organizing, in writing, in in combating illegal, you know. Uh, 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 the court system. They would carry no limit hanger when they go to court. You know. Um, yeah, I mean, he's he's who everybody thinks of usually when you know when they know anything about Filipino history is Jose yeah, Rizal. It makes, so. it makes us feel invincible, <laughs> Filipinos. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he, he's the one who inspires me. Right. So I love how you stay so connected to your Filipino heritage, your Filipino roots, and your connections. So, what are your aspirations for your art studio and your art school in the Philippines? Since you know, you do have so much you know, aspirations for staying connected to your heritage. What are your aspirations for your studio in the Philippines? Well, one thing I realized having uh, uh, been, you know, at a, a distance from the Philippines um, uh, after all this time in the United States is that we have to flip the script also and tell this our, uh, in the Philippines because it's still a colonial history. We're still learning our history through the history of foreigners in our country. And I feel like we need to do the same thing. Uh, first also is to introduce uh, Filipino-American history and, and Filipino-Americans like Larry Itliong. And in fact, that's one of the, 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 the main, the first things I did when I moved back to the Philippines and opened up my studio is to establish Larry Itliong Day so that uh, my goal eventually is for Larry Itliong Day to be a national holiday in the Philippines and that Larry Itliong be a global uh, the the hero of the global Filipino. So he'll be a representation of us and what he did because he 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 um he made history in America. He changed he he addressed the needs of the basic Filipino in America, which is their rights, their basic rights. Because most of the Filipinos uh, before 1965, which is what his, gen his generation was, domestics and work farm workers, and and it, they're the only ones who don't have a union, and he was the one who made that happen. So you know, and and you know, it happened to be a Filipino, right? But his impact is not just Filipino; it's all Americans benefited from it. So that that's our legacy here, and we have to like own that in the Philippines and, and and make that part of our history, right? So so do you so do you kind of see your artwork as as a role in promoting Filipino American history and culture in the Philippines? Is that kind of your goal with it? That's one aspect of it, but eventually I want us to uh, achieve critical thinking because uh, the way the way I see it is that. During the Spanish era, we produced Jose Rizal and the greatest generation of Filipinos because the education we got from Spain was the same uh, education they give to Spaniards. So it's like mm -hmm. being uh, seated next to Europeans in a, in a inside the classroom. We're learning the same material, and and those kind of uh, education encourages bold ideas and critical thinking. Unfortunately, during the American period. 
Uh, they use the same tactic with the Native Americans, which is uh, uh, indoctrination and uh, uh, boarding schools, assimilation schools. And that their intent was to make the white American to be the protagonist and the main event of their, of their history. So it, it's, it's aimed to rid America of Native Americans. And that's what happened with us. So we're not seated next to Americans or uh, the glo- uh, 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 you know, like Europeans or any uh, e- e- anybody in the world equally. We're seated with Native Americans in our classroom with, with the intent of making us Americanized. So we're not right. Filipinized or Americanized, right? So basically, we're not, we're kind of uh, not encouraged to think critically and own the knowledge that we're given. Because I believe we should question everything we learn in school because, no, you know, absolutely. everything's, a, you know, you have to know the knowledge so that you could be the source of knowledge. And, and until that happens. That's a really happens, good perspective. Yeah, until that happens, that's why we need artists. I think that's, that's why art is 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 the path to healing and and the path for us to become uh, uh, human beings at least you know to to humanize us uh, from being yeah. largely servile uh, and and yeah so I think that yeah what, and that's why you're that's why what you're doing and what your your work is has such far reaching impact and such far reaching influence so it's good obviously the Filipino American I highly 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 um appreciate what you do for our community you know so we're almost out of time but i do what you know what you're kind of going about with spain and europe i kind of have a quick fun question to ask oh, you know okay. all the different locations so to kind of round it off you know if you could teleport your art studio to anywhere in the world for a day not just necessarily the philippines you know, where would you choose to set up um i want to be transported to the to the grand uh, dining room of Lapu Lapu before they <laughs> when they had a meal before they went to battle against Magellan <laughs> and 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 find uh, out what does that space look like you know what does a Filipino uh, space for food look like because I think that's one of the reasons why we're invisible in America it's not colonialism it's Americanization uh, because like what I said again um during a um, Spanish period, we were encouraged to think critically, but during the American period, we were Americanized to the point that our uh, doll in the small world ride in Disneyland is a Polynesian, is in Polynesia, not in Asia. So our aesthetic in terms of Filipino food has been mis, uh, misrepresented with the uh, the uh, tiki tiki. Uh, yeah. Tiki, hut, tiki hut, tiki bar tiki aesthetic, hut, yeah. absolutely. The spoon and fork, the man in a barrel, all that came from the Polynesian. Uh, so it doesn't tell our story. It doesn't the food has nothing to do with the aesthetics in a Filipino restaurant? So, so I think know, that's a good choice then for you. Yeah, I think that's a good yeah. choice then to go back to Lapu Lapu's time to really see authentic Filipino. And I, I would love to see the art that you would create if you were able to go back in time <laughs> and do that. So yeah, I absolutely love that. Um, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I know we can keep talking and talking about Filipino history and your artwork, and I hope to talk to you about more about that. So before you go, though, I'm sure our own listeners would like to learn more. So do you have a website or a social media handle that we can share with our listeners so that they can learn more? Yes, um, you could visit my Instagram. It's lc72, um, uh, and, um, and uh, lcartsilva.com is my website. Awesome. Thank you for that. Thanks. So once again, I want to thank you, Eliseo, for joining me on today's show. And we would also love to hear from all our valued listeners about any suggestions for future guests or topics. Don't forget to subscribe to our program on your favorite podcast platform and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Twitter X, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. Asian Pacific Voices Radio is produced by Asian Culture and Media Alliance, a nonprofit that empowers the Asian Pacific American communities with a voice through media arts. If you'd like to support our program, please visit AsianPacificVoicesRadio.com. I'm Joanne Whitlock. Please join us next week for another exciting and thought-provoking Asian Pacific Voices Radio show. Thanks, everyone.